The world has so much to offer and I'm ready to take advantage. Tonight we celebrate culture, travel and history and indulge in a gastronomic experience from Asia, Europe and the land down under. Good evening, I'm Veronica Baluit Jimenez and this is Bridging Borders. hours to get to Sydney on a direct flight from Manila. It was a comfortable night flight for me with the gracious flight attendants serving food and drinks every now and then. I'm in Sydney and I'm being met by my friend and food. It was heartwarming to be welcomed by my friend who's been a resident of Sydney for many years. Sydney is the capital of New South Wales and is one of Australia's largest cities. Australia itself has a population of only about 23 million people, with Sydney hosting about 4.5 million of them. Our first stop was a market. where they sell the freshest fruits and vegetables at rock bottom prices. Flemington is located within the suburb of Homebush West, just a few kilometers from the city central business district. A wide array of colorful produce greeted us. It was a Saturday, so many people were doing their shopping. Flemington Market is open early morning until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Here you'll find not only a variety of fresh fruits and vegetables, but an array of nuts and an assortment of candies as well. Since it was almost closing time when we got there, the fruits and vegetables were being sold wholesale at rock-bottom prices. labeled one of the most beautiful cities in the world because of its idyllic balance of architecture, iconic landmarks, beautiful harbor, botanic gardens, and impressive skyline. Australia's most famous man-made icon is the Sydney Opera House. Its unique architectural design and engineering was formed out of a rare combination of innovation, creativity, and controversy. The Sydney Opera House hosts about 1,500 performances each year, drawing about 1.2 million people. Its Danish architect, Jorn Utzon, won the Pritzker Prize, which is architecture's highest award in 2003. Bondi Beach is located only 15 minutes from the Central Business District. It was recently dubbed as one of the top 10 beaches in Australia. Bondi Beach is famous not only for its proximity to the affluent eastern suburbs of Sydney, but also for its great sand and clear waters. Soon it was time for dinner. And our friends brought us to a signature dining venue in Piermont. We're here at the Black Restaurant at the Star Hotel and Casino. This is uh, one of the best steak restaurants here in uh, Sydney. And the chef here, Izard, is quite famous. I have here our friends from Sydney, Tony and Tiffany Lamb and their daughter and their host for tonight. 
Award-winning chef Tej Ezard is renowned for his bold and boundary-breaking fare as well as classical food style. Here at Black, Ezard is inspired by great American grills and contemporary European flair. I ordered the lamb, cooked medium well with salad on the side. This grass-fed lamb is very tender and as Australians would say, delicious, cooked perfectly. The lamb and the steaks came with various sauces and sidings that we truly enjoyed. It's day two of my visit here in Sydney, Australia, and this is the lovely view from my room. We see the harbor view of uh, Sydney right here, and it's a beautiful day. I think it's a lovely day to go yachting. So off we went to Port Jackson, also known as Sydney Harbor one of the most beautiful natural harbors in the world. There, waiting for us, was a 92-footer yacht, Octavi. Sydney Harbor has more than 240 kilometers of shoreline and meandering waterways. It was a warm, sunny day, and the harbor was vibrant and dotted with sailboats, cruise boats, and ferries. It's very windy on the Octavio. It's been rented out by Angelina Jolie and Oprah Winfrey. Don De Angeles, a Filipino who has been working and residing in Australia for many years, joined us in our Sydney Harbour cruise. He tells us about the must-see places in Sydney. Um, definitely you have to go see the Opera House. It's a fantastic place. Uh, it's a world-class architecture. Um, you need to see an opera there to be able to appreciate it. Why is it so famous? What's great about the Sydney Opera House? Um, it, it's quite famous. One, it's sitting in the middle of the harbour, which uh, offers a, a, the public a fantastic view of the Sydney Harbour. Um, and it's also world-class architecture. So if you've been in, if you go inside, um, it's it's really done quite well mm -hmm. uh, in terms of its architectural uh, structure. Mm -hmm. uh, the acoustics inside is actually also very good. John also tells us about the wide range of food Sydney offers. Cultural society, so you have a, a, a good sort of range of, uh, of food from um, the typical Australian to uh, Italian to Korean, Japanese. So it, it's a wide range of choices for, uh, for a tourist. And they have very good lamb shops here. They do, Sydney. yes. Oh yes, um, the steaks here are all fresh meat. So um, you're looking at the from paddock to plate type of setup. So you get them fresh from the farm into your plate. John says Sydney is also famous for their zoos where you can find koalas, kangaroos, and wallabies. It's a world famous Taronga Zoo, which is only about a couple of kilometers north of the harbor. Um, it houses a lot of those exotic animals here. My friend Anne tells us that the Octavi is often rented by famous actors and actresses from around the world. Anne says yachting is one of their favorite pastimes in Australia. How often do you go yachting? Uh, no, uh, two to three times a month. I mean, my family and then with our friends. Oh, it's very relaxing. And you, you, you see uh, a lot of uh, places in Sydney. Around the fringes of the harbor, you will see world heritage sites, national parks, and various communities. We were 
about 20 people in the yacht, including children like five-year-old Alexis. Alexis, you've been living here in Sydney for how many years? All your life? Five. Five years, okay. Well, what do you know about Sydney? Well, there's a lot of sharks. Sharks? Sharks. Yeah, what else? There's a, a lot of boats. A lot of boats. Do you like it here? Do you like going around Sydney Harbor? Yeah. Yeah? What is the most fun thing you did in Sydney? The real captain of the boat was Captain Nick Hovat, who tells us about the Octavi. Okay, this is a, an 82-foot sun slicker, made up, built in England, and then brought out to Australia. It's uh, 82 feet long, it has uh, twin 1300 horsepower diesel engines, and uh, twin 22 kVA generators and water makers. Holds about a thousand liters of water. The boat itself can uh, run at 32 knots, which is about 65 kilometers an hour. Have you seen a lot of stars uh, using this yacht? Uh, yeah, I've seen a few. Yeah, who, who were they? I couldn't tell you. Oh, it's I'm a sworn, secret? I'm sworn to secret. I heard this Oprah Winfrey and Angelina <laughs> Jolie. Sorry? <laughs> I have actually. Yeah. Not on this one. The luxury yacht has a master suite and two other bedrooms. So let's check out the rooms. I have to go downstairs to get to the rooms. This is the this is the master's bedroom. One of the best parts of yachting is not only enjoying the scenery and the feel of the wind blowing through your hair. It is also sharing with friends champagne, fresh seafood, including the delicious and creamy oysters of Australia, fruits and other nibblers during the four-hour cruise. We visited the Featherdale Wildlife Park in Doonside, Sydney. I was thrilled to be able to get up close and personal with a real koala bear. You can also play and feed the kangaroos, which are allowed to freely roam in the area. The zoo has a comprehensive collection of native wildlife. In the evening, we chose to have dinner at a Chinese restaurant famous for its king crabs. This is absolutely the biggest crab I've ever seen in my entire life. It's 8 kilos and it's worth $2,000. I can't wait to eat it. We were also served gigantic abalone and other Chinese delicacies. Sydney is home to many cultural museums and world-famous historic sites. The Art Gallery of New South Wales is the fourth largest in Australia. They say it is the most important public gallery in Sydney and is open to the public. The gallery made its first public exhibition in 1874. The collection from the early 1800s includes quite a number of iconic paintings and sculpture from the annals of Australian art history. We drove to Hunter Valley, Australia's oldest wine-growing region. 
They have a large selection of wineries and vineyards that consistently produce some of the best wines in the world. You can sample local cheeses, handmade chocolates, dairy goods, and olive oils direct from the producers. At many of the cellar doors, you can try out a broad selection of wines or join a wine tasting master class. restaurant here in Sydney and uh, this is one of the top 50 restaurants in the world of the San Pellegrino list. Let's try it out. The Key has long been one of Australia's most awarded restaurants. Aside from serving delectable, modern Australian cuisine, the restaurant provides a fantastic view of the harbour. We chose an eight-course meal which best reflects Chef Peter Gilmore's passion for nature texture, intensity, and purity in his dishes. We troop to the historic Queen Victoria building, more commonly called QVB, where shops sell various items from Australian fashion, unique art, antiques, and jewelry. The QVB was constructed in 1893 on the scale of a cathedral with Victorian Romanesque influence. The four-level building also has numerous cafes and restaurants to choose from. In the evening, we drove to a quaint restaurant called Blue Angel that has been serving its loyal customers for the past 50 years. They have an aquarium of huge lobsters and other crustaceans. They serve a fusion of Italian and Australian cuisine in a very intimate setting. This is probably the biggest lobster I've ever yeah. eaten. This is yummy. Okay. It's delicious. Guaranteed. Yeah. Here's a test in bite. Yes. It bites. Yes. It bites? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's this oh, okay. I can't wait to eat you. <laughs> <laughs> Appetizers included octopus, fresh oysters and sashimi, and prosciutto ham. For the main course, we were served wagyu steak, the mouth-watering lobsters cooked in a special garlic sauce, and pasta with crayfish and clams. The next day, it was time to go home. But before leaving the hotel, I caught a new story about Sydney being hit by a storm. Half. The rumble of thunder we hear has just been unbelievable. Wave after wave from Newcastle to the north to Illawarra to the south. No wonder it's been raining non-stop the past three days. It was so showering when I bid goodbye to Sydney, but nonetheless, I still had a totally wonderful experience. Love Knows No Boundaries, a story of a Filipina who is happily married to a German national. Join me as we tell you about the ties that bind them despite cultural differences. Joan Solis Machuk is a Filipina businesswoman who grew up in the island province of Romblon. Little did she know that her future would include a blending of cultures. During an event at the German club in Manila, she saw a man who she strongly felt would be her partner for the rest of her life. Can you tell us um, how you met your husband? I met him uh, in one of the lunches uh, in German club. And uh, there I, I tell myself, hmm, this will be my husband one day. Oh, first time you met him, you already thought that. And he was looking at me, and I was looking, trying to flirt, of course. <laughs> and then uh, he was introduced to me, and then after that, I said, okay, goodbye. And then after a while, I saw him again in one of the parties, and I said, oh, something is going on. So then he talked to me, 
And then after that, he gave his card, I gave my card, and that's the, the start of it. So he called me and we started dating. Soon after, they were wed and are now blessed with four children. Although they encountered quite a number of cultural differences, Gunter and Joanne managed to hurdle these challenges. Did you have a hard time adjusting to each other because he's German and you're Filipina? Maybe the first few years because, you know, they are so, they have strong personality. But I think I also have strong personality, so it, you know, it balances it. And um, I always, I always tell him, hey, uh, you are in the Philippines, you do what the Romans do, you know. You do what we do. You don't, uh, you don't tell us, oh, in Germany, it's like this. No, you do what the Filipinos do, but it does, we are happy what we are. And, you know, he, he followed and, and it works. One of the issues they had to tackle was the disparity between Filipino and German food but they easily reached a compromise in this aspect. Uh, when it comes to food, you know, he likes sinigang. And of course, sometimes he misses the German food, so I prepare, you know, the potato salad, baked potato, you know, the meat, sausages. sausages. Joanne didn't have to convince Gunter that they should settle in the Philippines because her husband had a thriving business here. One day, she brought him to her home province in Romblon, and Gunter immediately fell in love with the place. That's why he likes, you know, tropical weather, he likes, he likes Philippines. That's why when I brought him here, he, he was so happy and, wow, this is beautiful, you know. This was when they decided to put up Villa M, a Mediterranean-style exclusive resort that sits on a 2.5-hectare property in Tablas, Romblon. When we bought this property, it was empty. It was, there's no trees. And he has this vision of what can happen to this place. And here it is. In 1994, they started building what was supposed to be just a vacation home for her family and friends. But after almost two decades, their dream vacation home has been transformed into an exclusive resort with 11 themed bedrooms. And then it's progressive. Wow, well, when we feel that we need this, okay, we make this. Uh, we need the pool, okay, we make the pool. Uh, we put this roof, we put the roof. You know, we do it slowly, even the rooms. Okay, maybe we need one more room here and then every but, but year. Initially, is, initially it was supposed to be just for your family. Yes, but you know, I have a big family. And when they're all here, uh, it's not enough. So. We decided, okay, we, and even our friends, it's not enough. When they are here, uh, it cannot be, you know, uh, two inner rooms. That's why we have two big rooms, so family can stay there. But uh, we decided, okay, we make this, we make this, so for our family. But then uh, friends of families starts coming, and the friends of friends, they start coming. So until it became like a resort, a private resort. The resort is filled with various kinds of fruit-bearing trees. The sprawling gardens also allow for sports activities such as volleyball and football. It has an infinity pool which overlooks the Buena Vista Bay. One can get a beautiful view of the sunset in one of the cabanas facing the water. Joan says the interior of the resort was a result of a meeting of the minds and compromises with her husband. We ask our, each other, oh, what do you think of this? Of course, sometimes we fight, but most of the time, we, you know, we agree on what is good. Many of the furniture and decors in the resort were part of her collection and shipped from Manila. Both Joanne and Gunter felt that having been blessed with this little paradise on earth, they needed to share their blessings with the community. Joanne began giving scholarships to about 20 children in their town who could not afford to go to college. I gave them scholarship, uh, put them in a boarding house, and then uh, giving them allowances. But then I realized, oh, I'm giving them too much. I think the parents should also 
do something. Otherwise, I will, I will, like, I'm uh, teaching them to be lazy. She taught the parents of her scholars to sell produce in the market. She also adopted a strategy whereby the scholars, after graduating, will help their siblings go to college. We have this motto, uh, mag-aral at magpa-aral. That way, uh, when you graduate and you start to work, you can help your family. You don't depend on others. So until now, we are still doing it. And some of them are still here and um, they're working. They have, they have a service, uh, you know, to Villa M just to, you know, teach them how to set up the table, how to serve the guests. You know, it's good also for them to have to be exposed. And they're also happy. Yeah, and then uh, now some of them are working, um, doing their own thing. Being in a country where fiestas are traditionally held annually, Joanne felt she also needed to help her townmates participate in the fiestas. I saw, you know, in the town fiesta, when they have this uh, street dancing, I said, oh, my poor community, they don't have costumes. Their costumes are really not so colorful. So I decided, you know, the following year, I think I'm going to support this, okay. So I was able to get about 120 uh, youth from, from 12 to 19. And, uh, and they love it because we practice here, we make the costumes here, and then uh, they have their snacks, they're happy to have the snacks. The fiestas in Ramdon are filled with various activities, such as the practice of each family preparing different native foods to welcome relatives and friends in their homes. The lovely ladies of the town don their best gowns and fancy attire for the beauty competition with supporters from their barangays in tow to cheer for them. Tourists come to the island in time for the fiesta and to visit the beautiful unexplored beaches. Mayor Le Arboleda says the local government is careful not to over-commercialize the area in order to preserve the pristine environment. Joanne attributes all the good things in her life to the God Almighty and her wonderful relationship with her husband. She admits that being compatible with Gunter is a big factor in a long-lasting relationship. I like to go and meet people, and he loves it too. And he likes to go parties, I love it too. And uh, so, you know, he likes to dance, I like to dance. So that's why even our friends said, oh, you really compliment each other. That's why you have a happy relationship. But Joanne stresses that what is most important is to allow your spouse to be what he is, no matter what nationality. The way he's still a German, in a Philippine atmosphere. Yes, Philippine setting. You know, he likes to be in the sun. Uh, he walks by himself. He goes to the beach. Uh, it's not like, you know, uh, he's an executive, but when it comes to the island, he's an islander. A trip back to the 1940s when the world was facing its Second World War. A squadron of Mexican fighters came to help liberate the Philippines from its invaders. Many are not aware of this historical event, but Mexican heroism will forever be appreciated. Excellency, can you tell us why we are commemorating this event? What is significant about it? Indeed, this is a very important event for us Mexicans because of our strong ties that we've always had with the Philippines. This event focuses on the 70th anniversary of the arrival of the Squadron 201 that came from Mexico to the Philippines to join the Second World War and to join the liberation of the Philippines. It is basically a large, very large contingent of the Mexican Air Force that joined the Second World War 
to fight for the liberation of the Philippines in 1945. Why is it important for us? Is it important for us on many accounts. This year we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Mexican Air Force. And the event that took place in Manila with Squadron 201, it's the only event that the Mexican Air Force ever fought outside of Mexican territory. And this was directly, you know, focusing on the liberation of the Philippines. And you may ask me, why, why did the Mexican Air Force come as the only single event that they left Mexican territory to fight a foreign war? Why did they come to the Philippines to liberate the Philippines? Well, as you may know, the Philippines was highly connected to Mexico for a period of 250 years. I go many places in the Philippines, including all the universities, and I meet with the students. All the students know that, in fact, the Philippines and Mexico were linked somehow through the Acapulco Manila Galleon. But they, that's about it. And they all say that they were linked to the Crown of Spain for a period of 350 years. In fact, 500 years ago, for the first 250 years, the connection of the Philippines was not directly to Spain. It was directly to the Vice Kingdom of New Spain, which was Mexico. So, for the period in which the Philippines was connected to the Crown of Spain, which was a period of 350 years, the very first 250 years were linked directly to the Vice Kingdom of New Spain, the Virreinato de la Nueva España, as we called it, and that was Mexico. from June to August of 1945 was responsible for eliminating the Mexican Expeditionary Air Force in World War II. That is strength. Filipinos and Mexicans are very different, yet very, very, very similar. For us Mexicans, the Philippines is just like a step away from home. And I would invite all Filipinos to come visit Mexico. It is a country that will give them a lot more uh, um, um, experiences in the area of, of tourism, culture, tradition, religion. It's, an, it's a country that would welcome Filipinos and would ask them to really, really, you know, uh, uh, enjoy the friendship of the Mexican people. So I would say, I would ask Filipinos, don't forget to include Mexico in their upcoming agenda to include a visit in Mexico is a country that we welcome the Philippines with arms open. We look at the Philippines as, bro as, bro as the Filipinos as brothers and sisters, not as foreigners. For us, receiving a Filipino home is like receiving a member of the family. We travel far and wide to discover authentic flavors. And tonight, allow us to serve you something special. Experience delectable Spanish flavors that are definitely a feast to remember. La Fiesta Española is a Spanish food festival event of uh, Diamond Hotel Philippines. And this is in line with the um, project of Department of Tourism uh, for the Visit Philippines 2015. Madrid Fusion is in fact uh, an event, a culinary gathering that is being done in Madrid. But, however, this is the first time they're going to do it here in Southeast Asia. And they have chosen the Philippines as uh, a launching uh, venue for uh, the set event.
I think Spanish cuisine get popular for two different reasons. First reason is because the way of eating the tapas, people likes to have small versions of many dishes that you can choose every time. Now I want a bite of this, now I want a bite of this. So I think this way of eating is very popular in all the world. The Chinese, they got the dim sum, which is exactly the same. On Japan, you got the izakayas, which is exactly the same. So in Spain, we got the tapas, which is exactly the same. So I think this kind of way, make it easy for everyone to understand because you have different options. I don't want this one, I eat the other one. So that's why tapas restaurants are getting popular, okay, for the way of eating. And obviously, Spanish food is famous because all that great chefs, great chefs we have in Spain since 10 years ago, starting from El Bulli, the most now, was five years best restaurant in the world. Two years ago, El Sello de Can Roca was considered again best restaurant in the world. I think we have on the 50 best restaurants in the world, we have seven, eight restaurants, seven Spanish. So, of course, on fine dining, uh, Spanish cuisine represents one of the best cuisines in the world, and that makes it very popular. I had a very good, good uh, guest from the Philippines in this year, and their feedback is always very, very good. I will say they know a lot about Spanish food, and uh, they have also many references for pig, like the lechon, they have the chicharron, they have many things. So it's fun to play around with them in Spanish food, because they already have a little bit of base, and then you can just twist that and surprise them because they already know the tradition, so you can go a little bit more far. Um, for people that don't know the tradition, I always think it's better to give them the tradition, because why I'm gonna twist the dish and make a variation of something that they really don't understand first? So they are, obviously they won't understand the twist. So I like to cooking for Philippines, for Filipino people, because they got that base of knowledge of Spanish cuisine that allows me to go a little bit more far, a little, slightly more far, I don't go too far, slightly more far on terms of technique or twisting or changing some items. Traveling is about authentic experiences and rich cultural connections. It opens us to a wider and deeper appreciation of global diversity, food, culture and traditions. Good evening, I'm Veronica Baluit Jimenez and this is Bridging Borders. Thank you for joining me.